Um, so uh, the work that I would like uh, to talk to you about today uh, was mostly done in uh, collaboration between three universities, uh, Michigan State University of Toronto Aerospace uh, Institute of, uh, for Aerospace Studies and Princeton University. Uh, but I also would like to uh, talk towards the end uh, of the talk about some preliminary results that I did while on uh, sabbatical at uh, Imperial College. Uh, a good chunk of this work was supported uh, by NSF grants as well that uh, NSERC uh, of Canada. Um, so uh, I would like to start with this uh, cartoon of uh, flow past a uh, flat plate, which uh, everybody should have seen in their undergraduate fluid mechanics. And what you uh, know that in this situation, because of uh, viscosity, then we get this uh, layer of fluid uh, right near the surface where the f uh, flow velocity changes from the no-slip condition at the wall all the way to the free stream over a thickness uh, delta, which is known as the boundary layer. And this boundary layer initially is nice, laminar, and smooth, and steady. And uh, however, uh, when you look at the uh, boundary layer Reynolds number, whether you define it based on this thickness or you define it based on the X location along the plate, then the Reynolds number continuously increases as the flow progresses in the streamwise or X direction. As a result, the Reynolds number at one point, given enough length of the plate, will reach a critical Reynolds number, above which the boundary layer becomes unstable to small disturbances, and you start developing some unsteadiness within the boundary layer, which eventually uh, uh, amplifies and transitions the flow from this nice laminar state to a turbulent, chaotic, and three-dimensional state. It is this transition process that we're interested uh, in here today, and we want to look at ways of detecting when the boundary layer starts to become unstable, and if we can do something in real time in order uh, to attenuate this unsteadiness and prevent the boundary layer from transitioning to turbulence, or at least delay it so that a good chunk of the plate is subjected only to laminar flow. Now, uh, the reason we're interested in that is can be easily understood if you look at uh, this graph of the skin friction coefficient versus Reynolds number. And at low Reynolds number, when the boundary layer is laminar, CF is given by this line over here. When the flow transitions to turbulence, then CF jumps over to the stop branch that you see over here. So if we can, in fact, manage to uh, prevent transition or delay it substantially, we can push the skin friction coefficient from this, uh, such a high value all the way to this uh, lower branch down here. And therefore, we can uh, reduce the viscous drag substantially on the surface, which would have substantial uh, economic benefits for a wide range of applications, uh, not the least of which is uh, civil aviation, where typically about 50% of the drag on an aircraft during cruise conditions is produced by skin friction. Before I actually move ahead and, and to talk about uh, the control uh, system that uh, uh, we, uh, uh, or the control study that we're looking at here today to control transition, I'd like to point out that there are actually different paths of transition from the laminar to a turbulent state. And I would like to first clarify the two main uh, ways by which the boundary layer uh, transitions from the laminar to the turbulent state. I will do this uh, using a couple of videos that uh, I stole from uh, Tamer Zaki, uh, who has done extensive works on, in this area of boundary uh, layer transition using uh, direct numerical simulation. So what you're looking at here uh, on top is um, contours of uh, velocity, streamwise velocity disturbances as you look down on the plate. So the coordinate system here is streamwise, spanwise direction. And uh, the kind of uh, transition scenario we're looking at here is the one that has been most heavily investigated over many years and is known as the classical or Tolmin-Schlichting uh, TS uh, waves, uh, wave transition. In this scenario, the disturbances in the environment basically uh, initiates transition via these uh, two-dimensional waves that you can see there are uh, aligned with the spanwise direction, which propagate and uh, become amplified and eventually they form these uh, three-dimensional lambda structures which themselves become unstable and then form uh, the messy turbulence that you see all the way uh, at the right uh, end of, uh, of the video. 
Now, in contrast to this, there is another transition mechanism that bypasses this uh, classical approach, and that's known as um, bypass transition, just by the mere fact that it, it's different from the, the classical uh, approach. And just by looking at the picture, you can see that these are two completely different ways of transition. In fact, in this case, transition starts with, with these uh, elongated streaks of high and low streamwise velocity that are sitting uh, quasi-periodically side by side again along the span over here. Those streaks are, uh, as I said, are elongated in the streamwise direction and therefore typically they have a very low frequency signature. That's actually kind of promising from control perspective because that means that perhaps the bandwidth of the control is not going to be very demanding as many of other applications. In addition, uh, the, because these streaks sit side by side, they essentially produce high and low velocity uh, modulations along the span, uh, which produces shear in the span-wise direction. In addition, these features are three-dimensional, so they also produce shear in the wall normal direction. This shear gets amplified as the flow progresses in the downstream direction, such that it could lead to instability and you can actually, if you focus here, you see the development of these islands of turbulence, which are turbulence pots, which eventually merge together and coalesce to, to eventually become the fully turbulent flow. So in our control scheme, what we're going to try to do is we're going to focus on these streaky structures and we're going to uh, sense when they start to develop before they grow to very uh, strong strength and, and produce high shear and then try to put counter disturbances of the opposite side. So whenever we see low speed streaks, we would put a disturbance that would create high speed velocity and vice versa. And therefore we can hopefully uh, attenuate uh, or weaken uh, these streaks. Now, in order, uh, the scenario that I just described to you is, uh, is a scenario of superposition where you put disturbances that would sum up uh, with the existing disturbances but they are out of phase in order to cancel them. So that means we need to be operating in a, uh, in a flow regime where the dynamics are actually linear. Now, uh, in fact, uh, this is uh, one of the important uh, factors of, uh, of our control scheme. So again, I, I show one more video from Tamer Zeki over here. Uh, in this case, you see this is the same uh, uh, plane view parallel to the plate when you look from top and you can actually see a side view over here. Uh, if you put a sensor somewhere in this area where the streaks are growing, uh, say a hot wire sensor, and you measure a velocity signal and from that velocity signal you can uh, easily calculate uh, the RMS fluctuations and you, uh, you square that to get the energy. And you look at how the energy evolves with the, uh, with the downstream distance or Reynolds number, then you actually see this uh, algebraic uh, linear growth of the energy that follows uh, a straight line. But eventually you get this uh, sudden growth over here at a, at a higher rate and deviation from the line uh, and then a peak and, and so on. Now it turns out that at this point, and if you look at the video, you'll actually see this is the point where turbulence pots start to form. And if you track it all the way to the peak over here, this is the point where eventually you get 100% of the time turbulence. So our control scheme is aimed to operate in this linear zone over here, which we have, where we have what we call linear transient growth. So as long as we're in this linear zone, then we can put uh, opposing disturbances and they should add together with the existing disturbances because these disturbances are evolving linearly. So they, they have linear dynamics within uh, the boundary layer. Okay, so with this in mind, we can talk about the premise of our control. Well, the first thing that we did not want to do is to actually de deal with the, with the full-blown uh, scenario of bypass transition. One thing I forgot to mention, the uh, this classical transition scheme you get when you have quiet free stream and the boundary layer is developing over a smooth plate. However, if the free stream turbulence level is above half to 1% or so, or the, the flat plate itself has some roughness, then you get the bypass uh, type of transition. So uh, as you saw from the video, these streaks, they actually form uh, stochastically in, in uh, space and time. 
And we didn't want to deal with this uh, stochastic nature of the streaks when we tried to control them for the first time. So instead, what uh, we decided to do, we're actually going to create these streaks synthetically or artificially in the boundary layer by having this uh, cylindrical uh, roughness element. Now, by putting a cylindrical roughness element uh, in the uh, laminar boundary layer, what you do is the uh, 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 vortex lines in, in the uh, initially two-dimensional boundary layer will wrap around the cylindrical elements, and that produces streamwise vorticity where uh, an induced flow towards the wall from top to bottom is behind the element and away from the wall on the sides of each uh, one of these elements. Now, if you actually induce flow across the shear here in the boundary layer, this means you're bringing high-speed fluid close to the wall. And when you induce flow up from the wall up, then you're bringing low-speed fluid from the wall up. So now we have high and low-speed fluid streaks sitting side by side, uh, simulating the actual situation that we see in bypass transition, except in that case, we actually know where these streaks are. They're actually at a fixed spatial location. That makes our first effort to do the control much easier. So uh, the premise of the control then is that we actually have uh, such roughness elements which can actually uh, go up and down. So even though our streaks are stationary, they can still be unsteady. And in fact, this unsteadiness can be random if we want to do that. And when the streaks are produced, uh, then we have a, an array of wall shear stress sensors not uh, disturbing the flow. Uh, sitting near the wall that can detect when streaks uh, have formed. And if we actually know something about the dynamics of the boundary layer, uh, a model of some sort, which has to be a simple, efficient model that we can uh, utilize in real time, then we can actually, from the measurement over here, we can predict what the uh, flow and the shear stress is going to be at a downstream uh, uh, location further downstream. Knowing that, and then we actually uh, use an array of uh, actuators, which I'll give you a little bit more details about in a, in a second, to put opposite disturbances, essentially high and low speed streaks as well, but that are out of phase or are um, opposite to the existing disturbances from the roughness element, uh, in order to completely uh, uh, eliminate the disturbance in the, in the downstream location. Theoretically, this by itself should work to achieve our goal, and this would be feed-forward control. So it's, it's, it's when you know the disturbance before it actually reaches the actuator. However, in reality, first of all, we know that the boundary layer dynamics are complicated, so our model that maps the upstream disturbance to the downstream disturbance is going to be an approximation of the real model. In addition, any parameters in that model themselves may actually uh, uh, change as the flow conditions change, or they may have some uncertainty uh, when we determine the parameters in the model. So therefore, our prediction of what's going to be downstream is not going to be 100% accurate. So therefore, we allow ourselves to also detect whatever disturbance is remaining and then feed this back to another controller. So in the end, our entire scheme is a combined feed-forward feedback scheme aiming at uh, uh, weakening or canceling uh, those streaks. Now, the kind of actuators we used are the electric barrier discharge uh, plasma actuators. I'm not really going to spend too much time to talk about the details of these actuators, but I'll just give you a sense uh, of uh, what goes on with these actuators. Um, so basically, if uh, this white area is the top of our boundary layer plate, then we have an insert which is in gray that is flush mounted with the, uh, with the boundary layer plate. And the flow is in this direction. In order to uh, make one of these plasma actuators, you simply have to have a dielectric layer, which is this gray plate. And then you have high voltage electrodes, which are these lines up on top here with width uh, w sub hv and what we will do is we will put periodicity in the actuators that is delta z similar to the periodicity of uh, the roughness elements along the span over here and what happens when uh, you also have there is a, a ground electrode on the back of the uh, dielectric layer so when you put high voltage across the top electrodes and the ground electrode, then this creates plasma, which is uh, shown here 
in this purplish color, which normally in the lab you actually can look at it uh, in a darkened environment and you can actually see these purple lines of plasma. And the way the, the actuator operates is that it actually induces flow that comes down on top of each of one of these high voltage actuator. So then in this case, right on top of the high voltage actuator, you're inducing flow towards the wall. The flow hits the wall, turns around, and then comes back up again. So, so you can see you're producing down uh, velocity and up velocity side by side, which can produce the same periodic structure as the streaks you're trying uh, to cancel. Um, so with this in mind, let me just outline a roadmap of uh, this is how we went about doing the research and also how I'm going to uh, present this talk. First of all, we decided we're going to split the control issue uh, because this is a spatial temporal problem to first addressing the spatial problem where we have steady streaks produced by stationary roughness elements and we have distributed actuators and the question is can we produce or, or do the disturbances produced by these actuators can they be used to, to in fact um, uh, weaken the streaks within the boundary layer so that's that's just a question of synthesis uh, do you have uh, enough uh, or do these actuators give you the kind of disturbance that will cancel the existing disturbance from the streaks? So then we move on to address the temporal problem. With the temporal problem, what we decided to do to, um, uh, to minimize the complexity is to actually just uh, introduce uh, local streaks using a single roughness element and try to control this again with the feedforward feedback uh, uh, scheme. However, uh, in this case, the, uh, what we're really focusing on is the dynamics of the control system. First of all, how do we uh, design these controllers? Will they work effectively uh, to cancel the disturbance we want to cancel? And uh, in addition, uh, uh, what is kind of control bandwidth do we get out of this control? How fast can the control system react? And once we have done this in this model problem, which gives us nice controlled conditions, then can we take this knowledge and uh, translate this into the real problem where we actually have free stream turbulence and random formation of streaks within the boundary layer. And I will show some preliminary uh, result towards uh, this ultimate goal. Okay, so let's first focus on uh, the steady spatially distributed control problem. The experiment setup is a flat plate uh, where we basically uh, have a flap at the end that we can control. By adjusting this flap, you can make sure that the stagnation point is on top of the leading edge, which is a knife-like leading edge. Uh, this way, any separation that happens uh, around the edge will be on the bottom side of the plate, which you don't care about. Uh, we have uh, an array of five roughness elements uh, that has a spanwise uh, spacing of, of delta z. Each roughness element, uh, or all the elements are uh, placed at 150 millimeter downstream from the edge, and this is the height of the roughness element and the diameter of the roughness element. Uh, if you look at the local boundary layer thickness here, it's maybe two point something of the actual uh, height of the element. Uh, and the Reynolds number REK is 230, which turns out to be low enough that this cylindrical element doesn't produce unsteady disturbances within the boundary layer. So what we should expect to see are kind of high and low speed streaks that are steady uh, downstream of the roughness element. This is uh, an array of uh, four uh, actuators or four high voltage electrodes that are placed such that the high and low speed disturbances here coincide with their opposite counterpart coming off of the roughness elements. Uh, we uh, 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 used three different designs uh, where we varied the width of, of this actuator. Uh, so we used the design A, B, and C are five, seven, and eight millimeter. And even though those seem like uh, fairly small variations, they actually make some significant changes, as you will see. Uh, lastly, I would like to point out that uh, uh, any time you have a periodic disturbance, uh, you can characterize it uh, uh, by a wave number. That's the equivalent of, uh, of frequency in the time domain. In the spatial domain, wave number gives you 
an indication of the periodicity in this case along the span wise direction. Uh, so uh, this uh, wave number, we express it in non-dimensional form. So it's two pi divided by the wavelength, which is delta Z. And delta here, it's a bit of, a, of a, uh, not, not the best symbol to use, but it's actually uh, the laminar Blasius uh, solution, uh, boundary layer solution uh, similarity variable. That's what delta is. It's not actually the boundary layer thickness in this case. So this beta sub k is the non-dimensional wave number for the periodicity of the roughness as well as the, uh, uh, well, sorry, uh, for the actuator because this delta actually varies locally. So it's, a, it's, a, it's going to be different here than, than it is here. But for the actuator, the periodicity is this uh, 0.24 in, in non-dimensionalized form. Uh, this is just the base flow measuring the boundary layer thickness um, uh, uh, where uh, we are going to target our control. And I should uh, mention also quickly, the way we characterize the control is uh, we did hot wire measurements in a plane that is normal to the flow direction. And uh, this measurement is done at 400, 450 millimeters downstream. Uh, this is a single velocity component over uh, this uh, two dimensional plane. So uh, at the location of, uh, of, uh, of the measurement, this is the boundary layer thickness uh, compared. The line is the actual uh, Blasius uh, theoretical solution. Uh, and you can see also the development of the displacement thickness compared to the theoretical solution and the, the shape factor of the boundary layer. So everything indicates that we have a Blasius uh, boundary layer that we're disturbing. So let's look at some uh, control results over here. <clears throat> uh, first, let me orient to uh, what you're looking at. Uh, so each one of these, there are three maps here. Each map is wall normal and span wise location. This is wall normal location uh, in similarity variable. So that's eta. And the span wise coordinate is normalized by the spacing of the roughness elements. So essentially we're measuring uh, two wavelengths uh, centered around the middle. Uh, these are hot wire measurements. Uh, you average them in time, and then we're subtracting the mean Blasius profile. So we're looking at the disturbance. So if you look at the roughness by itself, then you can see right behind the middle roughness element, you see we have a high speed streak. The scale is given over here. It ranges from minus 10% to plus 10% of the free stream. And we have high speed streaks on the outside and low speed streaks in the middle. In fact, the low speed streaks here look like they're two low speed streaks that are trying to merge together. So they are, whatever is induced by the roughness element side by side, now they're actually coalescing together. You can see the actuator is producing also high and low speed disturbances side by side, and they're generally out of phase of uh, that of the roughness, which is what was done by design. So that's consistent with what we're trying to do. And if you, so each of these is produced when the roughness is, is uh, engaged by itself, when the actuator is turned on by itself. But now when you have the control, which means you have both the roughness and, and the actuator, then you can see we actually do change uh, the, the disturbance. Uh, however, clearly we're, we're not uh, making the disturbance uh, completely um, uh, canceled within the entire plane. And in fact, if you look more closely at it, you will actually see that we have what looks like a higher wave number, so like faster variation uh, along the span. Now, to understand better what's going on, what uh, we ended up doing is that uh, if you actually take a line across at the given height above the wall here, <clears throat> then you will see the disturbance vary as you go through the high and low uh, speed uh, zones. You can then do a spectrum calculation on that, and that will uh, decompose that uh, disturbance in terms of uh, wave numbers. Uh, and then you can do the same for all heights and then average the results across the entire boundary layer. So this is what you see over here. Uh, this is the, the wave number spectrum uh, versus the wave number beta. <clears throat> And if you just look at the black line, this is the, what the roughness produces by itself. So you see a huge spike at the basic periodicity. That's the 0.24 number that we we're talking about. So this is the main <clears throat> disturbance that you're putting in. There's a little bit of energy at the second mode and then almost zero by the time you get to the third mode. If you look at the actuator alone, you can see that it also has the main uh, input is at the primary periodicity. 
But then actually the blue line for this actuator shows that in fact it has non-negligible input at the second mode. More than that, it looks like at the second mode uh, when we look at the control later on, in fact the combined, when you introduce the control you're actually amplifying the second mode. Uh, and it also looks like it has a non-negligible contribution from the third mode here. Now, if you look at the control, which is the red line, you can see that there is substantial reduction in the first mode, which is, is good news. However, as I mentioned earlier, we're actually amplifying. So we reduced this mode, but we actually amplified the next mode. However, it's not as bad in terms of amplitude as that first mode. And moreover, if this happens to be <clears throat> a high enough wave number, so if you control a low wave number, and now you have a disturbance at a high wave number. If that wave number is high enough, this disturbance might actually uh, be sufficiently small in scale that it dies by viscous effects instead of actually, uh, instead of growing. However, the other thing that this points out is that for us to do the control is not going to be sufficient to have one actuator at one wave number. What you actually eventually would need to do is you, you, you have an actuator with uh, one wave number, then you have a second actuator that actually works at the, the second mode wave number. And if you needed a third actuator at the third wave, uh, uh, mode wave number. This way you can actually uh, tune the first actuator to cancel uh, the primary mode. And if there is another mode remaining, then you tune the actuator with the higher wave number to cancel this mode and then, and so on. And you only need to go up as high in wave number up to the point where the, the disturbance can die on its own because of viscous effects. Now the results I'm showing here is for actuator A. For actuator C we made the high voltage electrode wider and what that does it changes uh, the width of the high and low speed zones over here and in fact it also changes the uh, modal content of the uh, what the actuator put into the flow. So if you look at, at, this is the same exact one as this one, but now this is a little bit different from this one. And if you look at the uh, model breakup over here, you can see that now the control not only attenuates substantially the first mode, but it actually attenuates the second mode. Uh, and it does input a little bit of disturbance into, into the third mode. But just by designing the actuator more carefully, you can in fact, um, uh, control the disturbance better. You can understand this uh, even better if you uh, take this, these are the same two cases we we're looking at before, except now we're looking at mode one, mode two, and mode three, roughness, actuator, and then control, or basically the meaning the combined roughness and actuator. Uh, we also show here, this is a factor that basically gives you the uh, percentage reduction in energy in the mode because of the control. So if you first look at the, at the first mode over here, now we can see that you, you're canceling most of the energy in that first mode, but in fact actuator C is doing better job in, in doing this than actuator A, even though both of them have exactly the same uh, wave number as, as the roughness. But the difference is, is that the wall normal distribution of the disturbance that you produce by the actuator is not going to have the same exact shape as that produced by the roughness. So therefore the cancellation cannot really be complete. However, the shape here is better uh, than for actuator A. In fact, if you look at how much we're canceling mode A for, for actuator A, it's we're removing 93% of the energy and for actuator C, we're removing 97% of the energy. Actuator B basically sits somewhere in between. Now, if you look at the second mode here, for actuator A, you actually see that the second mode produced by the actuator is in fact in phase with the mode coming from the roughness element. So it actually, it, it's going to amplify it. Whereas when you look at this actuator over here, you can see that it's actually out of phase and that's why it's able to cancel it. So if you look at the table over here, we're actually amplifying that second mode by 400%. And uh, while when we use actuator C, we're attenuating its energy by 70%. So again, this highlights the importance of uh, uh, how we can design the actuator in order to have the proper uh, modal content. 
Okay, so this uh, basically demonstrates that spatially we can in fact uh, uh, target uh, the kind of disturbances, these streaky type disturbances that uh, exist in the boundary layer. Now the question if we're dealing with an unsteady situation where the disturbance evolved as a function of time, how well can we do the control and how fast can, can we do it? Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, so now we, we have the same scenario except we have a single roughness element here. We have a, an actuator over here uh, uh, to deal with the disturbance from the single roughness element. We have an upstream uh, or feed forward sensor. We have a feedback sensor as well over here. And we use hot wires to map the disturbance as needed. Uh, it's the same scenario we talked about before. I expect from the roughness element to have high speed streak on the inside and low speed streaks on the outside. We uh, embedded our sensor in the high speed streak over here and downstream, so this is the feed forward sensor. The feedback sensor is on the other side just to avoid any possible uh, interference, but it's also embedded in the, in the high speed streak further downstream. And the, uh, the plasma actuator should produce the opposite uh, kind of, of disturbance. Now, uh, the way we move the roughness element is we use this uh, kind of uh, neat uh, piezoelectric motor that's called squiggle motor. The whole thing is probably about yay big. I don't know how much you can see it, but uh, it's, it's all hidden under the plate. And this video just shows you how the uh, element pops up and down. Uh, what's very important about that, that's actually a servo motor. So we can uh, control the displacement and the acceleration of, of this element. Now, when we first started to do these experiments, we were just using simple solenoids. But it turns out that we, those solenoids were moving the roughness element so abruptly that we're getting strange disturbances in the flow. What we really wanted to do is, is produce high and low speed streaks that are modulated with some reasonable frequency inside the boundary layer. With the servo, we were able to go over a range of uh, accelerations, uh, velocity, etc. And I'll show you a couple of examples. The, the one on top here is the one we like. So this shows you as the element moves, you see how the uh, streaks are developing in time. So this is the streamwise location as we started the element uh, up over here uh, on the upstream end. As you can see, you essentially see this gradual progression of high and low speed streaks uh, within the plane. And eventually, if you follow this video, the, the roughness will go down and you will see uh, the decay of the disturbance. But I'll show you uh, another case where we exceeded the limits which we determined to be appropriate to produce these streaks. I want you to look at these planes of disturbance. And really, it looks at some stages like mayhem before you actually settle. So, so eventually, you settle to the right steady state. But in between, you can actually have some really strange disturbances uh, evolving. Uh, because when you shoot this thing up very strongly, it, essentially you create this uh, uh, jet that shoots into the boundary layer and you get all kinds of weird instabilities. We don't want that. We, we actually want to deal with streaks that are evolving as a function of time. Okay, so our control scheme in block diagram is as shown over here. So what we have is, uh, of course the roughness moves up and down here. The upstream sensor detects the disturbance and through some boundary layer dynamics G sub D, uh, the, that disturbance uh, translates into downstream uh, disturbance. The prime here indicates basically shear stress deviating from the Blasius shear stress. So it's any deviation from the, the, the steady Blasius solution. Uh, and if we know this G D, uh, uh, then what, and also, uh, sorry, I want to mention uh, in addition, so this one transfer function maps our upstream shear to our downstream shear disturbance. Then there is a function that maps the voltage input to the actuator into a corresponding uh, downstream disturbance, and the two should cancel in a, in a negative way. Uh, if we know these responses, these boundary layer responses, then for our feed forward control, if you tell me what tau prime u is, I can put it in this GD, and that will give me what tau prime d is. And then if I know what tau prime d is, I can put it in the inverse of P1 and figure out what voltage do I want. So my feed forward controller is simply GD times the inverse of this uh, P1 over here. And whatever is left over, we're going to feed it to the feedback uh, controller. And as you will see, we basically implement proportional integral control. 
So we need to determine these two, uh, these two models right here, these two transfer functions, in order to uh, first uh, uh, basically implement the feedforward controller. And two, if we have these models, we can rationally design uh, the gains for our uh, feedback controller such that the feedback control would have a balance between the speed of response and uh, stability. Uh, so uh, knowing these two systems then becomes uh, important. So what uh, we're going to do now is to, we're going to do input-output tests in order to determine these two functions. The first one is, is going to be uh, the boundary layer response uh, uh, GD over here. So what we do, we uh, keep the actuator turned off and we move the roughness essentially in a step response type test. But our step response, as we talked about, is not going to be a real step because it, it has to be limited in terms of acceleration and velocity. And what you see here, here's one step, and then uh, this is the roughness element movement over here. In response to that, later in time, you get the upstream shear sensor showing this blue line. And then later in time, that uh, high speed disturbance propagates to um, the downstream shear stress sensor. Uh, it turns out that actually a simple uh, gain and delay model works very well in here. In fact, unfortunately, uh, you may not see this very clearly, but there's a dashed line over here that actually more or less rides on top of this blue line, which shows how well the model works in capturing the downstream shear stress from the upstream shear stress. And we can determine this constant. There are two constants here, a gain and a time delay. And of course, the time delay is the time delay that it takes the disturbance to move from the upstream sensor to the downstream sensor. So it's a convective time delay. We can determine the, uh, the time delay from these traces as well as from the steady state shear stress, we can get this uh, gain factor. Uh, it's also important to see that when, when we do this for a, a range of roughness heights, then we basically get the same gain as well as the same time delay within uh, reasonable limits. So this suggests that, again, we're operating within this uh, linear dynamics range where uh, there is no dependence on the roughness height as far as uh, the model uh, responds. Uh, we do the same thing with the actuator. So this is a step voltage input to the actuator. And there is a, uh, in this case, you get a negative disturbance because remember the actuator is going to be opposite to the roughness. Uh, it turns out that the model here actually, it's, it's a delay again, because there's convective time delay from the actuator to the downstream sensor, but it also has first order dynamics. So there is uh, this time constant that you see over here. So it doesn't rise abruptly. Uh, on top of that, there is actually gain factor here. However, this gain factor is nonlinear because of the behavior of the actuator itself, not because of the nonlinearity of the, of the flow response. And we absorb this nonlinearity of this gain factor into this uh, new input, uh, which is called F. So if you notice before, I used to have voltage input and then this uh, system was P1. So now I have F and P. And I'm not going to go into the details of this, but essentially now we have uh, the model for the actuator has two parameters, which is the convective time plus this time constant uh, for the response. Uh, this shows again the, the, these two parameters, uh, the time delay and the time constant. Uh, the uh, range that we use, this is input voltage for the actuator, is, is over here, the circles. These axes are essentially dead band behavior for the actuator, and this is where the nonlinearity of the actuator comes from. So all, all of our parameters are confined to this range over here. <clears throat> Once you have uh, both, of, uh, uh, both of these parameters, then you have the two models we're after, and now you can design your actuators. So that, as I said, the feedforward actuator should just be GD times uh, inverse of P of, uh, of P of S, which is exactly what, what that is. However, when we looked at the parameters, we found out that the difference between uh, this uh, time delay from the, between the shear sensors and the time delay of the actuator to the downstream sensor is about 10%. So we decided to actually ignore this. And this number as well, the time constant, we also decided it was small. So for simplicity, we just went ahead and implemented just a, um, a proportional control on the feed forward. However, I will come back and, and discuss uh, these, these effects uh, in just a few minutes. 
Uh, as far as the feedback is concerned, we used a simple PI controller. This is written in the cascaded form. And you can go to some reference uh, like this one where they have different tuning rules in terms of the system parameters that you have here, TC and, and TV. That gives us the gain and, uh, for the proportional control and the time for the integral control. Uh, and there's an additional parameter here which is simply set to one, this, you can decide how aggressive you want your control to be based on that parameter. For what we did, uh, we actually set it to one. And uh, now that we have the control, we can look at some uh, results. Uh, first of all, uh, this is a busy graph, uh, but uh, it's, it's not very difficult to follow. The, the gray lines here basically indicate uh, the time at which the roughness goes up and then goes down again. Uh, so the actual shear stress with, that you're looking at here is the downstream shear stress. That's the one we're trying to control. Uh, and let me just pick the red line for now as an example. Uh, different colors are for different roughness heights. The, the red line, uh, if you don't have any control, it's this thin red line over here. So this is what happens. You produce a high speed streak at the downstream sensor. If you implement the control, then you get some transient from the control system, and then it eventually it drives the shear stress to zero. Now, you can see that, in fact, for all roughness heights, we're able to uh, control the uh, disturbance uh, the downstream to zero after some transients. And you can measure some transient time uh, over which the disturbance decays within certain limit from uh, what it should be without control to what, what it, it became with the controls. That gives you a sense of how fast the system actually responds. Uh, and if you, if you look at that, um, uh, then you have, these are different roughness heights uh, going uh, basically from the smallest one all the way up to the highest. It's not quite clear why we have different response time uh, for these uh, three lowest heights, but for the three, largest heights that increase as you go from 1.2 to 1.3 to 1.4, you can actually see uh, this is going uh, yellow, magenta, red. You can see when you go to the magenta, you start to develop an undershoot here. And when you go to the red, you actually develop some oscillations before it dies down. Now, so this oscillatory behavior is what makes the settling time uh, becomes longer. And if you look at the response without control, it actually has a peak over here. The same thing with the magenta, there's, there's a, a little peak over here. This peak we cannot really capture with our uh, model, so I, there is some nonlinearity that we're not actually capturing in this case, which appears at the higher roughness elements and which is causing that. Uh, but notice that the speed of, of response here is about uh, 0.2 seconds for the control system. Uh, you can also compare uh, here we have again three cases without control and then three cases with control. What we're looking at here is the effect of the control mode. So uh, what we have here is uh, feed forward alone. That's the blue line. And then you have magenta, uh, sorry, red is feedback control alone and magenta is combined control. With the feed forward, you actually get very quick control except it's not actually driving it to zero. And the reason here is because, as I will show later, this gain factor that we use for the feedforward controller, it in, in fact is an average over many cycles of input-output calibration. But the individual streaks that we produce may not actually, would, could deviate from, from that gain factor in terms of their behavior. Therefore, this shows you an example where the parameter in your control model, if it's not perfect, then instead of driving the shear stress all the way to zero, you're driving it low, but to some non-zero value. Uh, but here is where comes the benefit of the feedback control, because when you combine the two together, then the feedback can actually still drive this towards zero. So the presence of feedback accounts for any uncertainty in the parameters or the uh, appropriateness of your feedforward model. Uh, and notice that, uh, in fact, the feedback by itself is the slowest behaving system because the feedback suffers from the main limitation that the, the actuator is over here, but then you detect your disturbance in the feedback after it has passed over the actuator. So there is a delay time in the control. So therefore, this convective time to the feedback sensor is, 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 uh, is, is not desirable. 
And in fact, one should move this as close as possible to, to the actuator. And this is shown on the next slide over here, where you can actually see um, that uh, we, we do three different cases of control. The very thick line is the same case that we've been doing so far and we're looking at. And then we move the feedback sensor, instead of being 300 millimeters downstream of the roughness, we move the 200 millimeters downstream of the roughness, and then 125 millimeters downstream of the roughness, which I think puts it at about 25 millimeters downstream of the actuator. And uh, I apologize that this, this graph should be stretched, but you can actually see that the response time gets faster and faster as you, as you move uh, uh, the uh, feedback sensor closer and closer to the, uh, to the actuator. So, uh, so this is actually the same response time we had before around 0.2 seconds, but by moving the feedback sensor closer to the actuator, we can maybe improve it by a factor of five. Now I see that I'm, I'm running towards uh, the end of, of, uh, of the talk and uh, I, you know, I, <laughs> I guess as a lot of academics, I, I was too ambitious. So let me, let me skip over some of the analysis and just get to the next, uh, uh, the, sort of the, the last step. So, and I can address some of these in the questions period. So hopefully we demonstrated that you can certainly implement uh, in the model problem the, uh, this control scheme, and it does have promise, but one has to uh, figure out uh, the response time because it can be very limited because of these convective times. Uh, and I can be more specific in the question and answer period because we, we have some answers to uh, how far you can, you can push the system, etc. So, so now we actually put a grid in the free stream in a wind tunnel. So this is the work that was done at Imperial College. Uh, again, we're doing local control here for economy of experiments. So you have single upstream sensor, single downstream sensor. Now we actually, unlike the model problem with the uh, one element going up and down, we actually have two different actuators. One looks like an F and the other one looks like an inverted L. The difference between these two, one will actually produce upward flow, the other one will produce downward flow because, because with, with the roughness, we're only controlling high speed streak. But now in the real boundary layer, you're going to get high and low speed streaks. So you have to adjust according to uh, which streak is coming at you. Uh, now, if you can actually see with our actuator, so this is the, one of the actuators, and if you map the disturbance in a plane normal to the flow downstream of the actuator, at steady state, you're producing high speed streak and low speed streaks on the side. The other one produces the opposite sign. This is consistent, and more importantly, uh, the size of these streaks is about the size of the boundary layer thickness. In, in a boundary layer beneath a turbulent free stream, those streaks have, the, their spacing is about one boundary layer thickness. So we also tailor that to, to be comparable with the natural streaks. Uh, this is our feed forward, our GD, uh, which means we take our upstream sensor, put it through a model, and then estimate what the shear stress is, is downstream. We use uh, linear stochastic estimation, which I'm not going uh, to go into, but it's, it's, it's a fairly crude model, so, uh, but it's still, it, there is really no other options that we can think of right now. Uh, what you're looking at here is the actual shear stress downstream in the red line, and the dashed line is what we estimate. And if you do the long time correlation between these two, it's about 50%. But again, this highlights why you want a feedback sensor, because your, your feed forward model is not going to be perfect. Uh, so if we use this in a feed-forward uh, scheme, and, and this, this, by the way, this uh, linear stochastic estimation here is essentially giving us a gain and a delay, the same thing we had in our model problem. If we use this and, and implement control, this sho shows the RMS of the velocity distribution across the boundary layer at the location where we target the control. And uh, for each one of these colors, actually, you will see there are two independent runs, so you can get a sense of the experimental uncertainty. The green line is with the control and the red line is without control. And if you look at the peak energy here, we reduce that energy by 35% in, in the stochastic problem. Uh, the last slide is if you uh, go actually on and uh, in fact go to the feedback sensor, and now we're implementing uh, feed forward alone and then combine feed forward and feedback. Uh, the blue line here is the, what the shear stress sensor measures uh, without any control. 
If you implement the feed-forward control, there are two independent runs, the thick and thin uh, light blue lines here. Then you can see you can actually reduce uh, uh, substantially the low frequency range where actually a lot of the energy in the streaks is. Uh, if you, on top of that, add the black line, which is the feedback controller uh, on top of the feed-forward, according to the uh, design gain, then you get this black line, which I know it's very difficult to see from back there, but if you follow my um, laser pointer, the black line actually is down here. So in fact, it does improve over, uh, over the, the light blue line when you add the feedback control. However, you get this other disturbance that pops up in the high frequency range. Now, I actually just learned recently that this is, I think, what control people call uh, water table effect, S something like that, right? Sorry? Spillover. Spillover also is another term, yeah. Spillover, waterbed effect, something like that. So you, you damp it in one range and then it comes over in the other range. Uh, but what you can do is you can start to pull, pull back on the controller gain, the feedback controller gain. And for example, at point three, you have this magenta line where you can still have a good improvement over the feed forward alone and not as much spillover at the high frequency end. So again, this is showing promise in dealing with uh, real stochastic streaks. And I, you know, in the interest of time, I'm just going to leave my conclusion here and maybe open the, the floor for questions. Thank you very much. When you have such a violent launch on top of millions of pounds of thrust, mm -hmm. ridiculous vibrations. So we actually have a vibration table in the Space Physics Research Laboratory.